Uh, so I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, uh, happy uh, Valentine's Day to everyone, and uh, thanks for spending noon of your Valentine's Day with us uh, at the McLean Center. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Um, Catherine Rowland uh, is an assistant professor in the Department of Surgery section of Pediatric Surgery here at the University of Chicago. Um, Katie received her Bachelor of Arts um, as a university scholar with an emphasis in biology and the medical humanities from Baylor University. Um, she went on to receive her uh, MD and Master of Population Health Science degrees from Washington University in St. Louis. Um, she has uh, been here at the University of Chicago for the past several years as a pediatric surgeon with a clinical emphasis on minimally invasive techniques. Um, and her research focuses on moral and professional foundation in medical education. Um, Katie is a faculty fellow at the Hyde Park Institute and the course director of the Scholars in Ethics and Medicine program, where she teaches medical and undergraduate students in the cultivation of character using a virtue ethics framework to promote flourishing um, as a physician uh, and in life. Um, and today, uh, Katie will speak on uh, what would a good doctor do, an examination of the physician in the patient-physician relationship. So welcome, Katie. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm, I'm excited to be here and, and share some of my thoughts with you. Um, again, today we're going to do an in-depth examination of the physician in the patient-physician relationship. Um, I don't have any financial disclosures, but for those of you who are not aware of the Hyde Park Institute here at the University of Chicago, since I do mention it in my talks, I just want to state that it is a nonprofit that works alongside the university and it helps students, alumni, and other members of our University of Chicago community sharpen their purpose and strengthen their character to serve the common good. So there's several um, different things we'll be talking about today. I want to start with first defining the problem and whether it be burnout, moral injury, or a discussion of human flourishing. Uh, we'll go through kind of what is the current problem within the, the medical system today. I'll address briefly Aristotle's virtue theory and how character cultivation for flourishing might apply to medicine, especially its role in restoring uh, the individual physician. I'd then like to talk a little bit about how um, here at the University of Chicago, we've applied uh, Aristotle's theory to medical education and how we are teaching wisdom of our undergraduate students as well as some of our uh, early medical students. Um, and at the end, I'd like to conclude with the character of a good doctor and some future directions for growth. So what is the problem? I wanna start by showing some of the statistics about our medical students today. Because despite what we all see is probably a growing number of problems within our field, students are wanting to go into medicine in higher numbers than we've ever seen before. And in fact, when you look here from early 1980, to um, the most recent data in the past year, we're seeing increasing numbers of students, very bright students applying to medical schools, uh, 52,000 actually. And on this, this gra other graph where you can see that the, the y-axis has been changed, about half of those students are accepted into medical school. Um, so we've seen an increase in the number of students accepted, but it's still really only about half of the number of students that apply. Those numerical values are depicted here. Um, the top box shows that there were a total in 2023 of 52,000 applicants, of which there were essentially 23,000 spots for those applicants. Again, these are really smart students. The mean GPA was 3.77. These are motivated, smart students who want to become doctors. And yet something happens through the process of them applying and being accepted into medical school and the time in which they become doctors and the doctors in who they become. And I think some of it has to do with, with um, what their perception of being a doctor is. Many of them, when you ask them, want to help people. 
And so they start out applying and, and starting medical school, see, viewing our profession as one in which we are able to help and heal people. And then by the time that they themselves are physicians, they find themselves sitting in front of a computer, documenting on an EMR, stressed by the amount of tasks they have to complete, and the very little time they have to spend at the bedside actually helping heal patients. In fact, this state, this, these numbers are pre-COVID, so I would suspect that these states are even higher. But 54% of doctors say they are burned out. 88% are moderately to severely stressed, and 59% of doctors wouldn't recommend a career in medicine to their children. In ICD-11, burnout actually has its own ICD code, um, and I'm sure that there are people in this room who can um, empathize with some of the feelings or the description of burnout, feelings of energy depletion or exhaustion, increased mental distance from one's job, and reduced professional efficacy. I'm a surgeon, so I have surgery um, highlighted in this graph, but I think what's interesting about this study that looked at burnout and professional fulfillment, from a surgical standpoint, actually surgery on the, the y-axis is professional fulfillment. So there was a you know relatively high degree of professional fulfillment within my profession, and yet the, the physicians with burnout was still remarkably high. Um, that's depicted along the, the x-axis. And really, no matter what your specialty is, um, when, when questioned as to uh, physicians' intention to leave their current institution secondary to burnout, those numbers ranged anywhere from about 20 to 40%, with the, the average being about 30%. I, again, have surgery boxed off there. About 30% of surgeons uh, intended within the next two, two years to leave their current institution. But it's not just attendings that um, burnout is affecting. And in fact, when internal medicine residents were measured on the Maslach burnout inventory scale, 4.3% at the beginning of their intern year rated as you know, qualifying for having burnout. So very low numbers. By the end of that same year, 55% of those res residents met criteria for burnout. Something very malforming was happening during the process of their intern year. And in fact, uh, residents in general surgery, anesthesiology, orthopedics, and OBGYN are, are estimated to have the highest prevalence of burnout, most likely due to the high stress work environment they're in, the fact that they deal with life-threatening emergencies and overloaded shifts. Um, however, in studies that have measured it, the, the level of burnout changes a little bit depending what study you're looking at, but it's about approximately 40% in general surgery, 63% in internal medicine, 63% um, in neurology. And we know that burnout has very severe um, and adverse consequences, both in one's professional life, with an increased rate of medical errors, increased depersonalization, reduced compassion, and decreased interaction with patients, as well as personal consequences as well, such as substance abuse, strained personal relationships, depression, and even suicide. Because most of us who go into medicine are willing to jump through all the hoops, um, do the many things required of us to get into medical school and then into the specialty that we're in, there has been a shift to use the language instead of burnout to moral injury, and I'm sure most of you are aware of this. The focus when we talk about burnout, it can be very easy to focus the, the need to improve, right, to do better, to do more yoga outside of work, to come back to work fully recharged, to fix burnout on an individual level. And moral injury is used to describe really the constraints within our medical system that make some of these things outside our control. And so moral injury describes the challenge of both knowing what you need to do in order to care for patients, but being able to uh, provide that care due to constraints beyond our control. And it helps locate the, the source of distress on a broken system and not a broken individual. And we know that there are many things that are broken about our system, right? Like the electronic medical records, declining reimbursements, threats of litigation, increasing specialization that we see, just the rapid pace of innovation within medicine today, the, the need for 24 seven care of increasingly sick patients, non-adherent patients, and the fact that physician metrics and patient satisfaction sometimes outrank the actual care provided. And so I would argue that perhaps instead of using the terms moral injury or even burnout, we shift our focus and think about human flourishing. Human flourishing is a state in which all aspects of a person's life are good. And the way, the reason I like to use this to think about the current um, problems within the medical system 
is that it gives us a way to acknowledge and appreciate both the role of an individual physician, as well as the role that the system has and the community that we're working in. Tyler Vanderweel, who runs the, um, the Human Flourishing Institute at Harvard, um, talks about the difference between flourishing and well-being. And if you're around a hospital these days, you've heard a lot about well-being and well-being initiatives, right? And so well-being, if we think of that as the relative attainment of a state in which all aspects of a person's life are good as they pertain to that individual, and contrast that to flourishing in which you can attain a state in which all aspects of a person's life are good, but include the context and the community in which one lives. And so you can imagine that one might be able to attain some measure of well-being in a very corrupt environment, but one isn't really truly flourishing unless the community itself is good. So when we speak about flourishing, flourishing is not just a wellness initiative. I would argue that it's more than that. It's also trying to fix some of the problems within the community and the system. It certainly is not a way just to recharge your batteries and come back to the work the next day to be fully charged. It's not an answer to burnout because there are a lot of systems issues at play too. Um, and I would argue too, it's, it's really not about achieving work-life balance um, because if you're talking about flourishing, you're talking about looking at life as a whole your work and your, your life outside of uh, work are all your life. And so while it's very important to take care of ourselves outside of the hospital, what I'm hoping to focus on today is that what happens inside the hospital is what made us all wanna become doctors in the first place. So how can we divert our attention to fixing some of the things so that we have satisfaction with the careers that we've chosen um, and that we're happy with the work that we do inside of the hospital? I would argue that flourishing is acknowledging our humanity, acknowledging that our work life and our personal life are all our life, and that some aspects of flourishing will buffer against clinical burnout and be a source of resilience and fulfillment, but that's not the sole purpose of pursuing flourishing. So when we talk about flourishing, what we're talking about is a, a theory, a philosophical theory that dates back to the time of Aristotle. Uh, Aristotle's virtue theory in which character cultivation or the cultivation of character or virtue uh, leads to human flourishing. Again, this is not a new idea. This dates back to the time of the ancient Greeks. And the ancient Greeks and Aristotle were concerned with the, the ethics of being, of what should I become? The focus um, when we talk about Aristotle's theories are on the character of human beings. And he proposed that to be a moral person, one must develop or cultivate their virtues and demonstrate their virtues and their actions. And by cultivating both intellect as well as moral virtue, one flourishes as a human being. So how do we then develop virtue? Our virtues are habits and dispositions of character that can only be acquired through practice. So if one wanted to become a generous person, one would have to practice generous acts till being generous became second nature. To become courageous, one must practice um, acts of courage. And within thinking about these different virtues, Aristotle proposed the concept of the golden mean. So that in, in the center, right, there's a, a virtue, but you can have a deficiency of the virtue or an excess of the virtue, neither of which is necessarily good. And so when we talk about courage, you can imagine, especially as a surgeon, right, that you need to be trained as a surgeon to be, to be courageous. And then if you have a deficiency of courage and are cowardly, that's not good for you or your patients. But it's also not good to have an excess of courage, right? And to run full heartedly or rashly into an operating room without a solid plan or a good management plan for the patient. And that's true for each of these virtues that are presented here. Generosity, ambition, modesty, honesty, friendship, temperance, and self-control. And you can think of it like this, you know, that the, the virtue sits in the middle but there's a, a vice on either side. And so by cultivating virtue, one will act well and flourish. And there's been recent empirical evidence that supports that uh, virtue, um, by developing virtue, uh, that promotes life satisfaction, well-being, stronger relationships, mental health, and an ability to deal with adversity. So what does this look like in the 21st century? Um, Tyler Vanderweel has proposed five different flourishing domains. Um, and I think these are important to just talk about and identify. The five domains that lead into the ability to flourish that he proposes are happiness and life satisfaction, 
physical and mental health, meaning and purpose, character and virtue, and close social relationships. And then there's an additional domain for financial security, which also plays a role in your ability to be able to flourish. These five domains that are listed, though, are all nearly universally desired and an end in and of themselves. And so this is the flourishing scale, and I recognize that the, the print is small, but I think it's important to hear some of the questions that, that help us measure virtue. And so this short scale is um, 12 different questions because it includes the financial and material stability. And each one is rated from zero, which is poor, to 10, which is excellent. And at the end of taking the scale, you just take an average of all your numbers and that gives you your flourishing index. But some of the questions that I'd like to point out in dealing with meaning and purpose and character and virtue are in the middle there. Overall, to what extent do you feel that the things you do in your life are worthwhile? I understand my purpose in life. I always act to promote good in all circumstances, even in difficult and challenging situations. And I am always able to give up some happiness now for greater happiness later. So when, this, um, when these human flourishing skills are given in the general population, this is not specific to medicine, this is uh, the general population of the US amongst adults. Um, typically what's been seen in the past is that uh, people who are early on in life, which would be Gen Z, which is the blue area, and then people who are later on in life typically have the, the highest flourishing measures. So what's been seen in the past when this has been studied is that flourishing is high at the beginning of adulthood, right? takes a decline in mid-adulthood and then rises again towards the end of life. This is data post-COVID though. And this data is really scary because for the first time we saw that people very young in adulthood, right? The group that's 18 to 25 had some of the lowest flourishing scores. And that is much different than what we've seen in society before. And so instead of that lowest point of flourishing being kind of at the midpoint in your adulthood, in your life, we're seeing now that people are starting out um, as young adults with much lower measures of flourishing than they have in the past. When uh, these scales are applied to residents, um, this was a, the scale that's been given to internal medicine as well as psychiatry residents and the results of that study. The mean flourishing index for residents was 6.8. Uh, this is lower than the you know, age matched average in the United States. So our residents as compared to kind of their age match controls are, are not flourishing. Again, this is work from uh, Professor Vanderweel, but it shows different pathways that lead to flourishing. And I present it only because it talks about the, the different things that lead into the domains in which we measure flourishing. And family, work, education, and religious community are the four pathways he proposes that lead into our domains of flourishing. And the reason I'm showing this, this is because during the time of training as a resident, I think that work and education, and in some sense, your family and your sense of community are all wrapped up in the hospital. Um, that's part of what residency is. And so I think there are people who have still strong family relationships and perhaps strong religious community relationships during the time of residency. But even if just work and education are encompassed um, in you know, what they're doing here in the hospital, what we're, what we're teaching residents in the hospital and teaching students in the hospital has a major effect on, on their pathways to be able to flourish. And yet we're not very intentional about what we try and teach them to help them flourish. I also believe that this is extremely important because when you look at the entire flourishing index, the one question that arose from the index that was most predictive of a individual's flourishing in the future was from the character and virtue domain. And so if someone answered very strongly to, I always act to promote good in all circumstances, even in difficult and challenging situations, that had the most robust association with their subsequent um, composite flourishing later on in life. So this is a space in which we can act to help promote in people um, and to develop in people um, in ways in which they feel like they are able to promote good in all circumstances and have a huge impact potentially on the rest of their life and their subsequent flourishing. So how does this apply to medicine? Um, all of you, I'm sure, in the room are, are well aware of principle-based medical um, ethics. And the, the four principles or pillars of autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. Principle-based medical ethics trains physicians to be able to make morally permissible decisions using the principles of biomedical ethics. 
And for many medical students, this is the only exposure that they have to ethics during their medical training. I personally believe that uh, principle-based uh, medical ethics provides a very important standardized framework to approach many of the difficult and complex healthcare decisions and situations that were put in in the hospital. But the one thing it doesn't apply to as, as well is the individual physician who's helping guide or helping uh, families, um, sorry, I'm a pediatric surgeon, so families are helping patients uh, make some of these difficult decisions. In fact, one of the, the reasons in which um, we use principle-based medical ethics is so that we make sure that the physician's preferences, right, are, are not being put before that of the patient. It's really to focus the um, de decision that's being made on the decision that the patient would want. But part of, the, part of doing that, um, you can err on the fact that it then removes some sense of, of responsibility for the physician who's helping guide that decision-making process. And it also removes the sense of moral agency for the person who is caring for those people. And maybe it may not be as readily applicable to many of the daily ethical decisions that individual physicians are asked to make that are probably happening on a much more routine daily basis than some of the, the larger ethics consults um, and clinical situations in which an ethics consult is needed, right? Because on a day-to-day -day basis, you might be interacting with a family that is angry or upset. You might be um, in an interaction with a colleague who doesn't agree with a decision or a treatment plan you've made. You might be in your own personal conflict with something that's going on with your family outside of work. And so there are many ways in which virtue ethics applies to things that the principle-based medical ethics um, aren't as well suited to when we're thinking about an individual physician. And so virtue ethics it gives us an avenue just to start to discuss the character formation of physicians as individuals. Uh, this is not a new idea in medical ethics, right? This was um, really first introduced by Pellegrino back in the 1980s, this idea of using and applying Aristotle's virtue theory to medical ethics. And so I'd like to talk about a few ways that I think virtue ethics is, is unique and, and reasons maybe it should be taught alongside principle-based medical ethics um, and ways in which it's applicable in our daily lives as physicians. And one is because our character really determines our response in times of stress. So I look at this picture as a pediatric surgeon. This is a trauma bay after traumas come through, and this is probably was a pretty stressful trauma, right? There's blood on the floor. There's equipment strewn everywhere. I see, um, you know, we probably line kits or other, you know, maybe a thoracostomy tray. There's lots of equipment that has been opened around the room and left in disarray. And so how do you respond in situations like this in high stress environments? One of the reasons that surgeons and emergency medicine physicians are taught ATLS or given a very strong guideline of how to approach a stressful situation like this is so that you have an internal guide, right? You focus on airway, breathing, circulation, primary survey, secondary survey. Those of us who have been through surgical residency could probably do that and recite that in our sleep. You know what to do when you come into the trauma bay. You know what your job is and it's well embedded in you. You don't have to stop and think about it or weigh what to do in this situation. You know what you need to do. And character is much the same way. Character is how you're going to respond in times of stress. It's what's gonna come out when you don't have time to think about much else. And yet we spend very little time trying to prepare medical students in the character that they'll need to respond to the stresses that we put them in in the hospital. Right? We kind of assume we can teach them all the, the intellect and the technical skills that they know to be a doctor, but the, the stuff about their character or how to relate to patients or um, how to deal with controversy, they'll figure that out, or they've already learned how to figure that out. We don't really actively invest in teaching them some of those things. The other reason I think virtue ethics is so important is because, as we've discussed, uh, we'll react within our habits. There aren't always times to think. You don't always know when you're gonna walk into a, a situation that's gonna challenge your character, or your ethics. In fact, sometimes you knock on the door and walk in a patient room and walk into a, a patient who's very upset or angry. And sometimes you have warning, but sometimes you have no warning for about what you're going to walk into. And you don't have the chance to say, okay, I gotta leave the room for about 10 minutes and think about how I wanna to respond to you and come back. I mean, you can if you need to, but also your first response is gonna be the response of your character, what's been built into you. 
Character also informs our response to human suffering. Again, I think this is another thing we just expect students to know. Um, we expect students to know how to, to um, respond to people who are hurt or suffering. And as doctors, we're trained right to alleviate suffering. So our first thought is how can I, how can I make the suffering better? Um, we don't talk necessarily or train people necessarily how to sit with suffering, how to be around someone who's suffering, how to hear them, how to listen to them, how to show them love through the attention that we give them, um, and how to figure out sometimes their goals in response to suffering. And I would also argue that virtue ethics, well, it's applicable to patient encounters. I hinted at this early, earlier. It's also applicable to the way in which we interact with our colleagues. Um, we know in medicine, we work very strongly in multidisciplinary teams and with other groups of people. And the way in which you treat the people that you work with, I think very much is a mark of your character. Um, and that's not something that we really um, always talk about within the medical education system, how to, um, when there's a disagreement in the right, you know, care for a patient, how, how to resolve those conflicts, how to resolve conflicts when there's conflicts with the call schedule, right? How to respond to somebody when they, um, let's say, have had a bad outcome. Um, all these things we can, we can talk about and address when we talk about how we cultivate character. And finally, we know that from, from work done that, that virtue ethics is directly linked to personal flourishing. And I would uh, propose that it is probably linked to our pro professional flourishing as well. Medicine today is increasingly less focused on individuals. Um, and I would argue that virtue ethics gives us a way to start thinking about medicine as an individual physician and an individual patient again. And none of these things up here are bad things, right? Like evidence-based medicine is, is wonderful as is quality improvement. But the one thing that evidence-based medicine has done, right? You, the assumption is that any physician who's looking at the same patient and following the evidence-based guidelines would come to the same conclusion, right? And so it's removed a little bit of that individual autonomy that we have as physicians. So has quality improvement for, for some in some aspects, the way in which you know we have to cover shift work and call coverage. None of these are bad things. We're dealing with an increasingly sick system that's running 24 hours a day, so we can't be on call all the time. But how do we still maintain those individual relationships we have in light of that? Even the introduction of using provider at some institutions instead of physician, that you know any provider is a applicable, you know, round peg that can be moved around and fits nicely and you know in the pegboard there. And so I believe some of this has led to the active decay of the physician in the patient physician relationship. And perhaps many of the reasons that students who go into medicine become doctors who are disillusioned with medicine is I believe many of our students, um, as are many of our physicians, are, are more much more intrinsically motivated individuals than extrinsically motivated. And so medicine appeals to them because they see an opportunity for mastery, for having a meaning and purpose, for having a sense of autonomy in what you do. And instead, when they become physician, all of a sudden, all these intra extrinsic motivation measures are placed upon you, right? Your salary, your RVU, your quality improvement you know, points, where you stand on patient metrics for patient satisfaction. These are all extrinsic things that we're trying to imply in and motivate people with who are naturally, most likely much more intrinsically motivated individuals. And in fact, when it was it has been looked at, um, this is a paper from John Yoon uh, that, was, that was published recently. Um, when we look at the extrinsic motivator of salary, it wasn't really associated at all with physician meaning and commitment. Um, but when we look at intrinsic motivators, so a sense of calling, calling was associated with high life meaning and commitment to direct patient care. Personally rewarding hours per day were associated with career satisfaction, life satisfaction, and commitment to clinical practice. And having long-term relationships with patients was associated with career and life satisfaction and high life meaning. And so virtue ethics allows us to address some of these things and talk about the investment in the character of physicians, embracing our privilege in the patient-physician relationship, reestablishing a sense of community within the medical field and recognizing our single goal of providing the best care for patients. And so perhaps instead of being just a round peg, um, virtue ethics allows us a way to look at each other as larger pieces and unique pieces of a puzzle. 
And so I've talked a lot about how virtue ethics may apply um, within medicine, but uh, the big question out there is, is can you actually teach someone character? Is there any data to support that, right? It sounds great, but can you actually teach someone um, character? And I would argue, yes, you can. Um, what are we teaching now? By not intentionally trying to develop character, we're actually malforming patients, right? Because there is a hidden curriculum that's recognized within medicine. Um, and only a very small percentage of that, that green little piece of the pie is positive. The rest of the hidden curriculum that, that's not really publicized or widely acknowledged is vulnerability, privilege, dehumanization, hierarchy, and navigation and negotiation. And so it's not surprising in light of all that, that medical students in the US during the course of their training show that they decline in empathy, decline in moral judgment and have this increase in burnout and depression. And in fact, patients have picked up on, on what is happening within the medical field as well. 74% of patients had a mostly positive view of their doctor. 57%, um, so really only a little more than half of all patients believe their doctor cared about their best interests, the patient's best interests, all or most of the time. A little more than half think that physicians who went into the medicine to help um, take care of patients actually have the impression that patients have that, that physicians care about their best interests. And only 12% thought that their doctors could admit a mistake or take responsibility. I think this might be data that you guys saw before, but one of the things that I thought would always be the saving grace of our profession, our ability to show empathy, it's now being shown that perhaps ChatGPT is more empathetic than we as, as individual physicians are. And so when patients are asked, what is your ideal physician? They say that somebody who is competent, empathetic, humane, personal, forthright, respectful, and thorough. And we can ask the same um, question to, to doctors. When medical students, residents, and physicians were asked to describe a person who's a good doctor, they said that that person was fair, honest, kind, a leader, a good team player, and a, a person with good judgment. But sadly, they were much more likely to report that a good doctor should be a leader and a person with good judgment than they were to think that they possess those skills. And those are actual practicing physicians, right? As well as residents. But they recognized that a good doctor needed the skills of leadership and good judgment, but they felt like they did not possess those skills themselves. And when medical students were asked, can a person, can a, a person still be a good physician even if they're not a very good person? The majority disagreed that you could be a good physician and not a good person. So does character matter? Character is fundamental, um, especially important in helping us maintain constancy in the face of contingencies, ensuring that we stay true to our guiding values and purpose when outside events or pressures tempt us to abandon what we hold most dear. I think this describes residency today, but I th also think so this describes the experience of being an attending physician as well. And again, whether we're intentional about it or not, um, this character formation is happening. And medical students, when asked, agreed that medical educators should be responsible for helping train medical students to have good character. So how do we cultivate and teach this? Can this be taught? Um, the Oxford Character Initiative was one of the first uh, programs um, to examine whether character cultivation could still occur in a graduate uh, population of, of students. In, in, and they were able to demonstrate over the course of the year that for their graduate students that had enrolled within this initiative course, that they demonstrated an increase in service and gratitude through the course of their, their year of teaching. And they described seven practices to cultivate character, including habituation through practice. So as we talked about earlier, if you wanna be a courageous person, you practice courageous acts, reflection on personal experience, engagement with virtuous exemplars, using dialogue that increases your virtue literacy, being aware of situation variables, cultural influences and institutional incentives, having moral reminders and friendships of mutual accountability. So how does this apply for physicians? Um, here at the University of Chicago, we uh, instituted the Scholars in Ethics and Medicine course about six years ago now. It's an innovative curriculum that really hasn't been, is not done anywhere else in the country. Um, and we bring together both pre-medical students 
as well as some of our MS1s and a few MS2 students. The goal of the course is to help train future physicians for not only the medical knowledge and the care, but for the character traits as well that they will need to flourish in medicine and in life. And so one of the questions that I always start out um, our course asking students is what kind of doctor do you wanna be? And as you go through medical school, you get asked this question a lot, right? And usually the correct response, at least if you're going into surgery is I wanna be a surgeon, um, but it depends. You, you, students will answer this in, in many different ways. But the first thing we think about when we hear this question is what kind of specialty do you wanna go into, right? We don't stop and think about like, what kind of doctor do you actually wanna be? Not so much your, your resume virtue doctor, right? But your eulogy virtue doctor. Like I wanna be a, a kind and compassionate doctor. And so through teaching this course, we've come up with this constellation of virtues that describes different virtues or character traits that are applicable to flourishing as a physician. Um, and we uh, group these into three different categories. Um, and a lot of these virtues actually you could argue could be put in different categories, but the way in which we've arranged things is to look at both the ways in which your character or virtue affects your personal infrastructure the ways in which your characters are relationship supportive and the ways in which character and virtue can be uh, patient responsive. And so the goal really with our course is to try and cultivate students um, to think about and cultivate virtue now prior to them having really any true clinical rotations in hopes that they will uh, be better physicians in the future. Again, it's a year long course for the undergraduate students here at University of Chicago, they get course credit for this. Um, so it shows up on their formal transcripts. They get credit for having participated. Its first cohort was in 2017. Um, initially, you know, part of the, the purpose of this group is to create community and a space for reflection. So um, initially we had capped the, the applicants or the, the cohort at 25 students. Over the past few years, we've seen an increasing number of students who want to be involved in this course, and it's very hard to turn away anyone who wants to cultivate character. Last year, we had 87 students apply. The year before that, we had close to, I think, 84. Um, so this past year, we've admitted 40 students, 17 of which are medical students, and 23 of those students are, are pre-med students here. And during the the year-long course, we teach um, Aristotle's theory of virtue ethics in order to provide a framework and a language to talk about cultivating character. We bring in different physicians, both locally here from University of Chicago, as well as from across the country, so that the students have a chance to engage with physician exemplars, as well as mentors. We bring back fourth-year medical students, as well as some of the residents and fellows here um, who serve as mentors to the younger students in the course. We try and create a sense of community. And so when I show you the schedule, some of the events that we host are uh, purely social events. I'll have the students over at my house just for a chance for us to get and talk um, and, and see each other kind of outside of, of the lecture hall or a seminar. We explore the characteristics of foster humanistic medical care and try and offer students at, at a time in which they have um, space and time for reflection. This is just a sample schedule for, for the year. I feel like every year we add a little more. I don't think I could fit this year's course schedule on here. Um, but we have two large seminars, so two Saturday seminars, one in the fall and one in the winter in which we spend about five hours together um, talking through um, various lectures, having small group discussions. We then meet about once to twice a month throughout the, the rest of the year, um, in which uh, during which time we have, again, both local University of Chicago physicians, as well as those who travel from other institutions, come and talk to the students. We share a meal over dinner, and then we open up for a, an hour long um, Q&A and a chance for the, the students to ask these physicians questions and, and get to know each other better. During the course of the year, we talk about different situations, a call for virtue, as well as approaches and effective practices um, to, to help cultivate character and virtue. Um, so you can say, is this effective? We actually have been measuring this since the start of the cohort. Um, and the way in which we're measuring what we're doing is using what's called the situated wise reasoning scale, which is uh, able to assess five different aspects of wise reasoning. Basically one's ability to look at things from another's perspective, consider and change, um, the, consider how there are multiple ways in which one situation may unfold, show intellectual humility and a recognition of your own limits of knowledge, 
search for compromise and view the, uh, the event uh, through the vantage point of an outsider. And so this is our data here. Um, and when you look, the blue is the students who participated in the course. The reds are controls. So those are students here at University of Chicago who don't participate in the course. And so what we see is after a year long uh, participation in the course, that the students who are in our course show an increase in their ability to have wise reasoning, right? Their blue line goes up. And students who do not participate in, in this course actually show that their wise reasoning deforms during the course of the year. So not only do they not increase in their wise reasoning, they actually become less able to reason wisely and see another person, person's perspectives. So in our, in our last few minutes, I would like to talk about perhaps how this applies to which virtues might be most compelling for physicians. Which, which of these virtues, if we look at these as being important for physicians, which could we potentially target and teach and make a true impact in? Um, and I, I would like to propose that maybe the, the case for that in terms of the, the, a virtue to focus on as we move into the future is humility. Um, but first, I'd like to also just say that we can teach character, we should be teaching character, and we can do it through intentional curricular developments, but it does involve time, attention, and energy, which is something that students have much more of than residents, and so translating this into you know, um, a program for residents is more challenging, just because I know for myself as a surgical resident, when I was at the end of my day, I barely had time to reflect on the case I did that morning and technically how I could have improved um, what I did in, in caring for that patient, much less have the space and time to reflect upon my character or much larger aspects of, of who I was becoming. But it is important that we create this space and time for, for students as well as residents. And we do that through fostering relationships, demonstrating our own vulnerability and creating a culture that both recognizes and awards character and giving people a time to think about who am I becoming through this process and why am I doing this? Um, some of the new initiatives that are on the horizon, uh, the Hyde Park Institute, we're hoping to, to launch an extracurricular mini series this spring right after match day for the fourth year students. This is the, the first time we're doing this. So it'll be three you know, seminars over, over a dinner and talking about uh, with residents after they've matched and have, or sorry, with medical students after they've matched and have residency on their mind, what it means to be a good resident, how to have difficult conversations and deal with mistakes and bad outcomes. And then the, the last one, what to do with your page, when your pager goes off, a user's guide to maintaining compassion and caring as a resident. You guys, you may also have seen um, advertisements for the Meaning and Purpose in Medicine series. This also is sponsored by the, um, the Biological Science Division, um, Office for Faculty Affairs, as well as the Hyde Park Institute. And through this, we're hoping to try and change a little bit of institutional culture to talk about recognizing and cultivating characters really at all levels and investing in intending physicians and what it means to really have a clear sense of meaning and purpose in what you do. So I would ask as you're out there in the audience thinking about how all this applies and ties together to think of someone, a physician that you know that you consider wise. And why do you consider them wise? Is it because of the RVUs that they bring in? Is it you know, in surgery, a technical skill that they have? The number of publications or how long their CV is? is or do you consider them a wise person because of their clinical acumen? They always know what's happening on rounds. Or do they hold a position of leadership that makes you view them as a wise person? And I would guess that many of the things that actually make you consider that person wise, in addition to some of those extrinsic things or visible things are actually more character traits that that person has. And so as we think about how we can create wise physicians for the future, I think we really need to focus on how we intentionally create and cultivate character in our trainees. And one area in which we um, really have focused little attention on is the, the character trait of humility. And in fact, many people see humility as a sign of weakness but um, the word humility comes from the Latin and actually means grounded or from the earth. And so you can think of it almost like a tree that is strongly rooted within the earth. Humility in medicine is fostering a culture of continuous learning and collaboration and patient-centered and team-based care. And it includes accurate self-assessment, a recognition of one's limits, 
a low self-focus and an appreciation of others and an awareness of being part of a larger system and universe. Humble physicians are more likely to seek out information and get feedback, to listen attentively to their colleagues and stay on top of the latest research. They're more effective in multidisciplinary collaboration. They recognize and value others' contributions. They respect the patient experience and they're much more likely to gain patients' trust and adherence. And they mitigate errors and uncertainty. They're able to seek out others' insights. They acknowledge their own limitations and they learn from their missteps. And so instead of humility really being the vice of defect of, of pride or arrogance, I would argue that humility is the golden mean. Humility is a state of self-confidence and self-awareness. The, the vice of that defect would be being underconfident or timid or self-conscious. But humility is actually the golden mean between those two and what we should all aim and strive for. In surgery, um, I think this is, is very important. And this is my own definition of surgical humility. Um, but I think it includes confidence in one's technical abilities, a recognition of one's limits of expertise and experience, then acknowledgement that surgical outcomes are dependent upon a team approach, an expression of gratitude for all those that participate in a patient's care, recognition that the patient preferences, their support, and their social consideration are very important factors in their care, a reflection on the process and the outcome of the care provided, and finally, taking joy in the good one is doing while striving to continuously improve. And so character, character cultivation starts very early. That's one of the reasons that I um, am working with the undergraduate students and the early medical students. I really believe that that provides an opportunity to build into people before they're even exposed to the hidden curriculum within, within a medical center. Um, but I don't believe it's ever too late to start thinking about character cultivation. It does take time, it takes energy, and it takes a lot of attention um, to be purposeful about cultivating character. It does also needs to be modeled at all levels and both recognized and applauded. And then so really it's a conscious decision to invest in our trainees and who they are becoming, to show a genuine interest in them as human beings and focus their training, not just on the technical or the academic skills that they need, but really on the character traits that they need to be a good doctor in the future. And I believe that by helping uh, people cultivate, helping aspiring physicians cultivate their character, we can help uh, lead them to a sense of professional and personal flourishing. So I conclude with, with what kind of doctor do you wanna be? And maybe since many of us in the room have already declared what specialty we're going into, perhaps now is the time where you can stop and think about what you want to be known for in your career in terms of the type of doctor that you are. I have to give a huge thanks to my colleagues at the Hyde Park Institute who have worked closely with me in um, the Scholars in Ethics and Medicine course and, and really have, have made that, that course happen. Um, and I also would like to give a thanks to um, Jessica Kandel, who was the, the head of pediatric surgery when I started this academic per pursuit, as well as all of my partners um, within the section of pediatric surgery that allow me the time and the space to go teach the undergraduate students and accommodate the call schedule so that I can be there in the classroom with them. Um, on nights that there's that things are going on. So thank you so much for hosting me. I hope this has challenged a little bit, maybe how we typically think of, of ethics uh, in medicine. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. No, and I think that's very true. And I think that's one of the reasons why when we talk about well-being, it almost makes people cringe, right? To, to a little extent, because the way in which it's being done is maybe not the best way to be doing it. 
Um, and there are very important systems aspects to some of this, the EMR being one of them and completing charts. There's ways in which we could use AI or the benefits of technology to take away some of those things that remove us from the patient's bedside. Because again, when we think about motivation, I think for people who go into medicine, the intrinsic motivation was, was to take care of patients. And, and yes, charting is important, but charting is mostly linked to RVUs and, find, you know, like the hospital getting money, right? And that's not what necessarily motivates most of us who have become physicians. Not that it's not important, but um, it, it's not the true motivator. And, and I think that's really a cause for a lot of distress that, that physicians and our trainees are feeling within medicine because the, the motivation to go into medicine and, and help take care of others is um, not the same motivations being applied to them once they actually become a, a physician. Mm -hmm. There's data and there's certainly practices, you know, behind evidence-based medicine, but one, not every patient fits into that perfect mold either that qualified for that, if you're lucky in cardiology, that RCT, right? In surgery, we don't even have RCTs fueling most of these things. Um, but again, evidence-based medicine in and of itself isn't a bad thing, but I feel like it does take away some of that aspect of having a relationship with your patient that you're able to know things. I had a patient return to my clinic the other week with hydradenitis. Now, hydradenitis, there's not a lot of evidence-based medicine. This patient had bad disease and I had started her on doxycycline because I was really the first person to diagnose her. And she presented a week early for her three month follow up with an abscess and called and, you know, can I get into the clinic right away? And, you know, I asked her like, okay, well, how has the medicine been? You know, like, are you taking the medicine? And her mom said, we can't afford the medicine, doxycycline, they can't afford it. So she wasn't taking it. And now she had an abscess and it actually had to be brought into the hospital. It was bad enough we had, because she had induration and cellulitis of her entire arm from an axillary abscess. So we had to bring her into the hospital on IV antibiotics. And, um, you know, I, I, I miss that when I first met them and talked to them, you know, like we, we obviously had a, we, we weren't on the same page. And I think that happens so many times where we prescribe patients these things, but we miss the other aspects of their life that are preventing them from actually being adherent with that medication or that treatment. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Hmm. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah. And I don't think it's it's just empathy. I think we do a bad job though modeling how to help even distinguish between hurt and suffering and and find out where a patient might be and what they might want, what they might prefer, right? Like the the teaching, the hidden curriculum within medicine almost is just to get in and out of a room where they're suffering as quick as possible. And there are exceptions to that. There are doctors who do a very good job with, with sitting who, with people who are suffering and figuring out ways to help them. But there are a lot of times when there's a suffering patient on the floor, the, 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 the amount of time that the physicians actually spend in the room is, is less than, than the other patients they're caring for on the floor. People don't like to be, not all people like to be around suffering. And so by, by not really providing any guidance or training, as to how to think about this when you're a student or a trainee, I feel like we're doing them a disservice. And I do not mean to imply in any ways that humility is the only virtue. In fact, part of the constellation there, I think all of those aspects of the constellations of virtues to think about are important traits for physicians and we're not trying to make us into round pegs. I appreciate that each of us will have our own character traits and will be stronger in some characteristics than others. And that's part of which what makes us able to provide care to so many different people, right? Like we don't want just one, one doctor, one clone of one person running around and, and treating everybody. I think there's something unique about the fact that we all have different character traits. Humility is one I think that we as physicians do a bad job at. And in fact, if anything, the training has been to be less humble, um, to almost beat that out of people, people who um, may come in with humility. That's something that's almost by, by the unintentional curriculum that, that is happening is being forced out of people. And so that's the reason I bring attention to that one because I think that's one where we could try and teach and make a true difference in the kind of the end product of residence. But I don't by any means think that the, the only character trait that physicians should have is humility. I think there's a, a wide array of different characteristics that physicians need to be able to treat the, the wide array of characteristics that is within humanity. Yeah, Megan. Mm. Yeah. So character cultivation and the path to flourishing is, is a lifelong process. So you can still cultivate later on in life, but you're right. 
there is a certain age, um, you know, the, I, I am not a psychologist, so, you know, do not quote me on this, but usually it's around the age of like 26 to 30 in which the character that you have becomes more firmly cemented, um, which is one of the reasons too, to, you know, try and reach students before they've reached that age in which some of those character traits become not necessarily that you can't cause a change, but you can't cause as large of a change. They have formed their sense of identity that might be delayed. No one's ever studied it in physicians, right? There's a lot of things that's delayed about the process of going through medical education um, in terms of personal development. And so maybe there's a, that opportunity for character development through residency as well, but it's going to become harder. Um, and that's part of the reasons for creating a very intentional change of culture that's modeled from the leadership down. Um, but that really takes being intentional about things because a lot of these um, things that we're talking about are not things that traditionally surgeons or physicians were awarded or recognized for. You know, there's not an award for humility um, that the, the University of Chicago awards to a physician every year. Um, and so thinking about ways in which we can show to the younger generation that these are things that we actually value and do matter and matter more than just you know, an email that says these are our, these are our core values, um, but one that we live out and show. Um, but, you know, one of the things when I went into surgery, um, people said that, told me to my face, I was too nice to be a surgeon. And I never understood why, like, why could you not have a, someone who is technically good and also technically, or, and also has a good bedside manner? Like, why do patients have to choose? Why should they have to choose? Why couldn't you be a nice person or a good person and also be a good technical surgeon? Um, I don't think that we should make um, patients, you know, have to choose or compromise between having someone who is technically good and having someone who is a, a good person. Um, but I, those, those stereotypes about different fields, you know, are still alive and well today. Okay. Thanks, Ryan. When I have talked about this in an ideal world, when I've talked to medical ethicists that um, are passionate about virtue ethics and teaching that, I think the ideal way would be to introduce students to virtue ethics first because it gives them kind of an expanded view of what ethics can be and then provide them the education and the teaching about principle ethic, the principle-based ethics. Because if you teach principle-based ethics first to medical students, it almost narrows their ability to see what, what the rest of ethics could be. And so I believe both are very important to be taught, but there is something to be said about teaching the character aspects first and then providing them later on with the principle-based framework to think through complex situations that they would be in. Thank you. So a reminder for everyone in case conference is in the library today. 